Good morning. Welcome to Cedar Rock this morning. We're so grateful that today you could gather with us today in worship. I'm going to begin with Psalm 134 to get our hearts tuned to the Lord this morning. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today and we want to bless the Lord because you have blessed us in so many profound and amazing ways. Father, we pray that our worship would be uh, glorifying to your holy name today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning. This morning, our first praise hymn is Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, page 15, in the red hymnal. We're going to sing all three verses. Please stand. Father, you are the fount of all of our blessings, and we thank you for those blessings today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, welcome this morning to worship. We're so grateful that you could join us today. It's a special day uh, because today we've got the Beasley crew back with us, plus (laughs) some extended family. Uh, Yeah, there we go. Praise the Lord for that, and we get to... Uh, later in the service, officially commission them off for their, their next mission. And so we, uh, we look forward to doing that with uh, gratitude, with tears, but with gratitude for, uh, for, for all that you have meant to us. We'll do that later in the service. After the service today, we're also going to have a fellowship uh, with the Beasleys down in the basement. So even if some of you are, are visiting today, maybe you don't even know the Beasleys, still come by, get some, some food down the basement after the service. Uh, Get to know them and, and have a chance to fellowship and just have a chance to, to, to give them your parting words and your parting blessings. So we'll do that in the basement. Some ladies have worked really hard to prepare that, uh, so we look forward to that. So stick around after the church service for that. Uh, also, we have, we're excited to announce something on the next slide. Uh, Kids Connect Blast Off. So we... Uh, Instead of a traditional VBS this year, Vacation Bible School, what we're thinking about doing uh, is having uh, 
kind of VBS every Wednesday night in the month of August. So, and this would potentially restart Kids Connect. So we've got an opportunity to really um, invest in these kids and, and create something sustainable here. So we're gonna have more details in the coming weeks, but prayerfully consider how you can serve with us for this. And uh, we look forward to having Kids Connect blast off during the month of August uh, for our kids in our church and our kids in our community as well. So more details to come with that soon. One last thing, reminder, nursery. If you wanna take your kids to nursery, that'll be after the choir sings and they will take, uh, take our kids back to the nursery for that time. Uh, as we transition to our time of prayer, a couple things we want to pray for today. First, we want to continue to pray for Miss Janet and the Ronnie Pleasance family. We're continuing to pray for you, Miss Janet. We also want to pray for Miss Peggy Pinnell. Elliot, did she have an appointment this week? No, it's not this week. Okay. Well, she has an appointment coming up. We don't know when. All right. Well, let's pray for her upcoming appointment. I think she's generally doing better after her procedure, but uh, they've got some things to look at and decide in regards to the cancer. So let's pray for Miss Peggy, pray for her family. And I know Miss Peggy watches every week, so Miss Peggy, know that we are praying for you. Let's also continue to pray for Glenda Parrish, who, uh, to add to her long list of <laughs> problems she's had over the last few months, has COVID again. Um, so she's doing a little bit better this time. This was not as, as, as rough as the first go around, but let's pray for Miss Glenda. Also for Joe Clemente, uh, who uh, has a mild case of COVID. We want to lift him up in prayer. Miss Marianne Fuller, Willis Gupton. I want to pray for Paige as well. Uh, Randy Wood, Meredith Walujo in Uganda. Alma Hudson, Barbara Yuri, Francis Murray, Wesley Young, and Miss Patricia. She cares for him. Bethany Walker, John Brosia, Mary Helen, and Gupton. Any other prayer needs we can lift up today? Yes. All right, we'll pray for Jean and Marta Whitehead at Peachtree uh, Baptist Church. Marta is, has been overcoming cancer, and Jean, her husband, has COVID, so we want to pray for them. All right, David and Brenda, broken toe, fractured elbow, put them together, you might get a full working human body. All right, we'll pray for y'all, absolutely. All right, well, let's bring these prayer requests and praises to the Father this morning during this family prayer time. I'm gonna pray aloud, you pray in your own seats. Father God, we thank you that today we can come to you, that you are a God who is holy and mighty and sovereign, and that you're also a God who beckons us beckons your people to come near to you in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we get to come to you in prayer. We know, God, that we are sinners. We fall short of your standards. We fall short of your glory. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the blood he shed, the empty tomb, the, the, the freedom and forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ and the privilege we have to come to you in prayer. Father, we pray for these many needs. We pray for uh, our brothers and sisters in this room, perhaps, who are going through great trials and great sorrows. We pray that you would be with them and give them strength. We pray for those who have great praises and are rejoicing. We pray that you would also be with them in their joy. And we pray for our service today as we sing, as we study your word, as we commission uh, a family that we love dearly. We pray that your spirit would be present with us. Your name would be glorified above all else. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, our second praise hymn is The Bond of Love. Um, it's a very short song, so um, if we can, we'll sing verse 1 and 2, and then we'll go back and sing verse 1 again. Okay? Please stand.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Lynn and Irene, as always, for how you bless us as well. If you have a Bible this morning, let's see your Bibles. Hold them up high, okay? Some of you act surprised that I say every week. I tell you, bring so I hope you hold your Bibles. If you don't have one, though, we've got pew Bibles, Burgundy pew Bibles. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 49. Genesis chapter 49. As you're flipping there, I'd be remiss if I did not uh, mention and, and, and make as a matter of prayer the uh, Supreme Court decision on Friday to overturn Roe v. Wade. And, um, and just thinking about that, thinking about how we as Christians can respond. I've written some things down. I've shared that on our Cedar Rock Facebook page, an article that I wrote if you want to read that, my, my longer thoughts. But in general, just some ways we can respond to that, uh, that news. First, I think it's entirely appropriate to celebrate um, because abortion really is a, a grievous, grievous injustice and that victimizes the most vulnerable among us. So it's appropriate to celebrate. It's also entirely appropriate for us to be ready and willing to get to work. Say, so what do you mean by that? I mean, we need to get to work continuing to advocate. This does not mean abortion is gone. It just reverts the question to the states. But it also means that we need to get to work loving people. Say, what does that have to do with abortion? In more likelihood, there will be, as a result of this, more pregnancies born out of wedlock, more broken homes, more need for adoption, more need for foster care. And I think if we really believe God's word and we believe that uh, we're called to be a blessing to our neighbors, then then being pro-life on paper won't cut it. we got to be able to be willing to support and, and invest in those around us who are, who, are, who are involved in this frontline work, so supporting adoptions, helping those in foster care, uh, investing in pregnancy care centers, that kind of thing. Uh, we really have an opportunity with all of this to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And what a tremendous opportunity we have uh, now, as, as we have always had, there are several organizations that have, do a really good job. They have, they have been on the front lines of this. I'm thinking of Human Coalition and Raleigh, uh, a great organization that we can support. One final word uh, to, in light of all this. In a room this size, undoubtedly, there's somebody here where abortion is part of your story somehow. And if that's you, I know that these conversations probably are very difficult. You probably feel an immense sense of shame. I want to remind you and encourage you that the grace of Jesus Christ is offered to you. And that any sin, no matter how egregious it may be, no matter how, how hard it may have been, any sin can be forgiven by Jesus Christ. And so I want to offer that, that encouragement to you today. If, if abortion is somehow part of your story, don't run from Jesus, run to him. Because he can heal and he can give you the grace and mercy that you need. Just want to share those words. I have some more words written down. You can see that uh, on our Cedar Rock Facebook page. But let's pray as we get ready to dive into our text today. Father, we admit today how much we need you. We admit today that we are entirely dependent on you for our life, for every breath. And Father, we pray today that in the light of this really encouraging news, that you would help us as believers to be um, advocates of hope, those willing to serve, those willing to give, and bringing the good news of Jesus to all corners and crevices of our world, our culture, our country, and the people around us. God, as we open your word today, we realize again also we need your help. Teach us, grow us, transform us by the word of God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when we reach the end of the road for something, when we reach the end of a job, when we reach the end of an internship, <laughs> when we reach the end maybe even of our lives, we face the challenging task of figuring out what to say in those moments. Like, what do you say 
in your parting words? What will we say to Cody and Allie later in the service <laughs> in our parting words? Maybe, and you think about all the situations in life where you have to say parting words, maybe you say something like Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry was a great Bible scholar, pastor. Uh, his final words before death, according to, to some sources, something eloquent like this. He said, a life spent in the service of God and in communion with him is the most pleasant life that anyone can live in the world. I'm telling you, if I'm about to face my deathbed, that's, that's a pretty eloquent thing to say in my parting words. Maybe your parting words will be like blues singer Bessie Smith. I'm going, but I'm going in the name of the Lord. Maybe your parting words will be like composer Jean-Philippe Rameau, who, as he's laying there in his final moments, has a priest come beside him and sing some words to him, sing a song. <laughs> the composer said, what the devil do you mean to sing to me, priest? You are out of tune. Yeah, that's probably, uh, <laughs> probably funny last things to say. Maybe your, your last words or parting words will be like those of the Oceans movie, Oceans 11, 12, 13. They always say, I'll see you when I see you, right? Or maybe... Your parting words are those of the Redneck's famous parting words. Hey, y'all, watch this. So there's a variety of parting words, from the most eloquent to, hey, y'all, watch this. Today, before we offer our parting words to Cody and Allie, we come to the point in our study of Genesis where Jacob offers his parting words to his sons. Jacob has gotten older. Jacob is near the end of his life, and he, in his parting words, delivers a series of blessings and a few curses <laughs> to his sons. So today, let's look at Jacob's parting words, and we're going to group them in three categories, the bad, the good, and the glorious, okay? The bad, the good, the glorious. Let's look at the bad first. Genesis 49, verse 1. Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel your father. Here we go. First kid. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. All right, kids, you know uh, Bruno? Do we talk about Bruno? No, we don't talk about Bruno. Well, we don't talk about Reuben either. Or at least Jacob didn't like to talk about Reuben. You, the kids got that joke. All right, that's fine. The rest of you didn't. The kids got it, and I'm fine with that. Reuben was the oldest kid. He should have been the natural leader. He should have been the one to receive the birthright. But Reuben squandered it. Verse 4, we, we remember why. Uh, Jacob says, you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. What was he talking about? Jacob is remembering an incident that happened some 40 years prior. It, it's recorded in Genesis 35 where Reuben, if you remember, Jacob had four wives. Bad idea, but he did. Reuben had a fling with one of his dad's other wives. This was an awful, awful thing to do. An egregious sin. Jacob gives Reuben no blessing. He just gives him a prophecy of a bleak future in which the one who should have been preeminent does not have preeminence. And that's precisely what would happen in the years to come as the, the son Reuben and his, would develop into the tribe of Reuben. None of Reuben's sons, descendants, rose to prominence. You look at the list of kings, there's none from Reuben. Look at the list of judges, there's none from Reuben. There's no prestige from Reuben's tribe. And in fact, when it's time later in history for the captivity, guess which tribe would go first? tribe of Reuben. Reuben's blessing, or his lack thereof, his lack of blessing, reminds us of an important lesson that we're going to see in the bad parts here. 
Sin has consequences. Sin has consequences for us. Sin has consequences for others. Sin has consequences for those we even care about the most. But it's not just Reuben who gets the short end of the stick. Let's look at verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel, or my glory be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willingness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So in this next blessing, or lack thereof, Jacob lumps his other next two sons together, Simeon and Levi. And he says, basically, I don't even want to associate with you. And what do they do that you don't want to associate with them? He says, they were guilty of fierce anger. They were guilty of violence. And again, Jacob is referring back to an incident, Genesis 34, a really awful, tragic story, where a guy named Shechem, prince of a nearby town, came and he violated their sister Dinah. An awful, egregious evil. There needed to be justice served based on what Shechem had done. But Simeon and Levi were not interested in justice. They wanted revenge. So in that story, we studied it some weeks ago, they crafted this scheming plot. They went and they murdered every man in Shechem's hometown, and they took the women and all the livestock for their own as servants, and they stole all the stuff. Okay. What they did was not justice. They committed war crimes, right? It's kind of like, now, I don't encourage you to do this. Please don't do this. But if you were after church, to, as we're going down to the fellowship, you look at me and you punch me in the face, okay? I would not be happy that you punched me in the face. But what if in retaliation I went and I set fire to your entire house? Is that fair? Is that, is that justice? No, that's, that's revenge. Or to take an, an, another level, if you, if you actually did something worse, if you harmed someone dear to me, which is more equivalent to what happened here, and, I, and it was a wrong thing, and, and, I, and I wanted justice, but instead of going to the authorities and getting justice, I went and I planted a bomb, and I blew up your whole neighborhood. Would that be fair? Was that justice? No. Revenge. And that's what these two sons were guilty of. Other innocent people died because of their actions. So Jacob speaks curses over them. He says, verse 7, I will divide them in Jacob. I will scatter them in Israel. And again, we look at history, and that's precisely what would happen. Simeon's tribe virtually disappears by the time they enter the promised land generations later. Simeon's land is kind of engulfed by Judah. Levi's tribe, if you remember, the tribe of Levi became known as the priests, if you remember that from your history, Old Testament history. But they didn't have any land of their own, so again, they would be scattered throughout. The idea here, again, sin has consequences. Now, to be clear, are Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, are they still part of the family, yes or no? Yes, they're still part of the family. Their sins, their mistakes, their awful things they did, did not erase their identity as sons of Jacob. But though they are still part of the family, though I imagine Jacob probably forgave them, though God, if they went to him in repentance, surely forgave them, their sins still had consequences. Their sins would affect them and their families for generations. And we need to remember this today for us. Listen, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if God has saved you, the Holy Spirit indwells you, you're one of his children, you are a part of God's family, period. Your sins, your bad decisions, my sins, my bad decisions cannot erase our identity in Christ, our part, being part of the family of God. Our sins can be forgiven. But listen, even though that is the case, our sins still have consequences. 
And forgiveness from God, forgiveness from others, does not necessarily erase those consequences. Thinking about Reuben, thinking about Simeon and Levi, this morning, are you more like those sons than you'd like to admit? Are you more like Reuben than you'd like to admit? You have lusts that you're feeding. You're guilty of engaging in sexual sin. This morning, are you more like Simeon and Levi? You're angry. You're combustible. Any little thing will send you over the edge. It may feel good, as it probably felt good for them to indulge that sin temporarily. It may feel good to feed that bitterness and rage temporarily. But if we believe God's word, there will be consequences for our sins. Sin has consequences. And this morning, if you are dabbling in the Reuben's sins, if you're dabbling in Simeon and Levi's sins, why not repent today? Why not bring those to the Father today? So we start with the bad. And I'm sure you're thinking, man, for a commissioning service, this is very depressing. And indeed, this part is depressing. It gets a little better from here on out then. Let's look at the good. The way Jacob has structured this blessing, he's kind of ordered these kids by their mom's names. But we're, we're going we're gonna to highlight, um, we're going to skip a couple names and come back to them in a minute. So let's jump down to verse 13. Let's talk about Zebulun, the son, not the town, okay? The son, not the town. Zebulun, verse 13. We read, Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall be at Sidon. Zebulun, he's saying, basically, is going to be this place of great commerce, going to be a, a great, great place to live and make money. He's saying, Zebulun, you're going to be blessed. All right? Let's look at Issachar, verse 14. Issachar is a strong donkey, which actually is a compliment. Okay? Don't, usually we don't call people donkeys, but this is a compliment. Issachar is a strong donkey, crouching between the sheepfolds. He saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant. So he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant at forced labor. The picture here is that Issachar's descendants one day will live in and work in a productive land. Now I'm going to need your help because we've got a lot of names here. Zebulun was blessed, and we can say Issachar was blessed. Can you say that for me? Issachar was blessed. Thank you. All right, we've got some more names. Let's look at Dan. Not this Dan, this Dan, Okay. Verse 16, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heel so that his rider falls backward. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. And the picture here is the, the name Dan sounds like the Hebrew word for judge. So he weaves that, that word play into the blessing. He says the judge is going to be judging his people. The judge is going to be a snake, sneaky, strong like a snake. Zebulun was blessed, Issachar was blessed, and Dan was blessed. Thank you. All right, looks like a Gad. Next, verse 19. Raiders shall raid Gad, and he shall raid at their heels. Again, more wordplay. The name Gad sounds like the Hebrew word for raider, so it's like he's saying, um, Gadders shall Gad Gad, but he shall Gad at their heels, or Raider shall raid, raid, raider, it's confusing. Anyway, but he shall raid at their heels. The picture here is that Gad is, is, is going to be a, have a positive vision. He's going to be strong. They're going to be tough. So Zebulun was blessed. Issachar was blessed. Dan was blessed. Gad was blessed. Let's look at Asher, verse 20. Asher's food shall be rich and he shall yield royal delicacies. I want to live with Asher. That sounds pretty good. Asher's going to have some good food, good stuff. Asher was blessed. 21, Naphtali. Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. The tribe of Naphtali would come. There'd be beauty arising from this tribe. Naphtali would be... A little, try one more time. Naphtali would be... 
Yes, thank you. All right, skip Joseph. Let's go to verse 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoil. Picture here is of Benjamin being a fierce warrior, like a ravenous wolf. And that's what would happen. We look at history. The tribe of Benjamin had a lot of military feats when they went and entered the, the promised land. King, leaders like King Saul, leaders like Esther, you know the book of Esther, came from the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was blessed. Good job. Now, most of these tribes that we listed here, you probably, let's be honest, don't know a lot about them. I don't know a lot about these tribes either. But the general trend with all of these sons, with all of these tribes, is blessing. God would bless these sons. God would bless their families. God would bless them for generations and generations to come. And when you compare what Jacob said to Ruby and Simeon and Levi to what he said to these guys, this is a whole lot better, is it not? <laughs> a whole lot better than what he said to those first three sons. The portrait, I think, that, that Jacob is showing us here is that when God's people walk in God's ways, not like Reuben, not like Simeon, not like Levi, they are generally blessed. Let me say that again. When God's people walk in God's ways, they are generally blessed. Now, this is not always the case. It's not like um, God is a candy machine and we stick in three acts of obedience and expect a piece of candy. That's not how it works. There is still suffering. There are still trials. There's still little joys, like little Boaz here, sweet little buddy. There's still suffering. There's still trials. But generally speaking, when God's people walk in God's ways, they are generally blessed. For example, uh, any of you, when you were kids, or any of your kids have Lego sets? Y'all have Legos before? All right. When I was a kid, I had some Lego sets, and I had this really big Lego set of a um, police station. Big box, lots of pieces, hours and hours and hours of work putting this wonderful Lego set together of this police station. I was so proud of it until my uh, little baby brother destroyed it. Different story, different time. But now, if you had one of those big, complicated Lego sets, hundreds of pieces, would it be smart to take all those pieces, pour them on the floor, and just try to look at the box and build it yourself? Yes or no? No. Why not? You don't have a plan. You know what you're doing. It's not going to end up looking like how it's supposed to look. The better plan is to follow the directions. Because the makers of that building set, they want you to succeed at building this thing. They've laid out the plans, given you instructions for how to put it all together and how to have this big, nice, complicated Lego station. Now, you're probably going to make some mistakes along the way. You're probably going to misinterpret uh, uh, an instruction, maybe put a, a certain block in the wrong place. But generally speaking, things go better if you follow the maker's plan. Does that make sense, right? And so it is with the Lord. God has given us a, a wisdom for living our lives, a, a, a guideline for how we can walk in his ways, and things generally go better for us when we walk in those paths. For example, God's word says, do not murder. Okay? Low-hanging fruit here. Things will generally go better for you if you, if you obey that command. God's word says, do not steal. Things generally will go better for you if you obey this command. Why? Because God's plans, God's guidelines, they're not burdensome. They're not because he's mean. They're because he's good. They're for our good. God knows the pathway that will cause us to flourish. And he knows what will cause us to wither. Psalm 1 I think paints this picture so beautifully. And if it's okay with you, I want to read Psalm 1 to get this idea of, of what it looks like to walk in God's plans and to see and to experience his blessing. Psalmist writes, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Does this picture in Psalm 1, does that describe your life? None of us is perfect. None of us put the Lego pieces all together perfectly. We're all sinners. We all fall short. All of us need grace. But is the posture of your life bent towards following the maker's instruction, doing what he's called us to do, living as he's called us to live, because God's plans, God's burdens, God's guidelines, they are not burdensome to us. Things go better when we follow his plans. All right, we looked at the bad. We looked at the good. Now, let's look at the glorious. You say, what do you mean by the glorious? We skipped over two names in this series of blessings. Let's go back and look at those two names because their blessings are just a step above all the other blessings that, that Jacob has doled out. First, let's look at Joseph in verse 22. This is what Jacob says to Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, harassed him severely, yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hand of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your father who will help you, by the almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents. Up to the bounties of the everlasting hills, may they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who is set apart from his brothers. In this blessing, Jacob portrays his son Joseph as being attacked, as in a very real way he was. But Joseph stands resolute. Joseph is strengthened by the Lord, and Jacob prays that blessings would overflow Joseph's life. He prays that God Almighty would show his, his divine favor to Joseph. And it's hard to read this without feeling Jacob's abiding love, abiding affection for this son who he thought was dead, and now he's back, and you just feel it overflowing. Jacob can't contain his love for Joseph. But between the previous blessings we studied last week, which when Jacob blessed Joseph, and this, jo this blessing is clear, Jacob is giving Joseph his birthright. In other words, the birthright that's supposed to go to the oldest First Reuben, then Simeon, then Levi, they all messed it up, is now going to the second youngest. Joseph's blessing. Pretty, pretty glorious. But there's still one more blessing we want to look at that, if it's possible, is actually better than Joseph's. Let's look at Judah, verse 8. Judah, verse 8. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Maybe your translations say, of the nations. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he was washed, he's washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. J Jacob says, Judah, your hand is going to be on the neck of your enemies. He says, Judah, you're going to be like a lion. 
He says, Judah, you're going to be super wealthy. That's the picture we see when it says that he's going to tie his donkey to the choice vine, right? You know, how many of you, if you had a very expensive um, garden, would tie your donkey next to it? I don't think that sounds very smart, right? You wouldn't do that. But he's saying, Judah, you can do that because you've got so many great vines, you can just tie your donkey next to the best one. He says, Judah, you're going to wash your garments in wine. Why why would you do that? The picture here is he has so much wine, he's so wealthy, he can wash his clothes in it. I don't know about you, I don't even splurge for Tide, right? (laughs) I go for the cheap stuff, all or whatever, you know, the cheaper stuff. I'm not going for Tide, that's more expensive. He says, you've got so much wine, so much wealth, you could wash your clothes in it. And then there's this. Again, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Let me ask you a question. What kind of person holds a scepter? A king. King holds a scepter. When it says the scepter shall not depart, it's not going to leave. What does that mean? Is he going to be king for a short period of time? Long period of time. It's not going to leave is what Jacob's saying. And to him, it says, shall be the obedience of the peoples or the obedience of the nations. In other words, he's saying, Judah, from your line is going to come not just a king over Israel, not just a king over this family, but a king over the world, a global, worldwide king such as the world has never, ever known. And then Jacob kind of leaves us hanging with that longing for this king to come. So we see Joseph gets the birthright, which is a miracle, but Jacob gives this promise to Judah of future kings. And indeed, if we were to follow Judah's lineage, guess which little uh, giant killing king would come from Judah's line? David. David and Solomon and on and on and on would come from Judah's line. Now, if you've been with us some time, if you've been studying our study of Genesis and, and, and you've been with us and reading this, it may surprise you that Judah gets a blessing like this. Because when we first met Judah, he was a whole lot more like Reuben, Simeon, and Levi than any of these other kids. Remember, it was Judah's idea to sell Joseph into slavery. It was Judah who mistook his daughter-in-law as a prostitute and availed himself of her services. Judah was a sinful, selfish, greedy man. But something changed in his life. God got a hold of Judah's life. And when he was confronted with what he had done to Tamar, when he realized the depths of his sin and what he had done, he said these remarkable words. He said, she is more righteous than me. Can you imagine saying that about a prostitute? She is more righteous than me. Judah realized he was a sinner. Judah realized the depths of his sin. And that confession of sin led to a complete change in Judah's life. A complete change in Judah's character. How do we know? Because a couple weeks ago, we saw Joseph try to test his brother. He wanted to know if Judah was still that same scoundrel who'd sold him into slavery. And so when given the opportunity to to leave Benjamin behind, Judah does not do what he did all those years ago. Judah instead says, you know what? Dad loves Benjamin. Send Benjamin home. Take me instead. Judah, once selling a brother into slavery, is now willing to give his life so another might live. God dramatically transformed Judah's life. Judah realized his sin. He repented of his sin. And God slowly but surely transformed him and made him into this guy who one day 
is going to see a king come from his line. And this long, sweeping story we've been studying about Joseph for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, seeing Joseph's rise to glory. At the same time, uh, kind of under the radar, we've been seeing Judah's humility and his transformation into a man of God. We wonder, so what's going on here? We were left with this hint, this desire for this king to come, and, and, and we see this, what's going on here? Well, through Judah would not just come a king like David. Through him would come the ultimate redemption. Through Judah would come lots of earthly kings like David, like Solomon, like all these guys. But there's something bigger coming. God has been hinting at it through all of Genesis. Genesis 3.15, God gave us a hint of a snake crusher to come who who would be wounded, but he would kill the serpent that led them into sin. Genesis 12, God promised to Abraham that through his descendants would come a hope for all nations. Now, God's telling Judah that through your descendant will come someone who's going to hold a scepter for all time. He's saying, Judah, through you will come a king for all time. Thousands of years later, that snake crusher, that hope for the nations, that king for all time would be born in a stable in Bethlehem in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at who, what Jesus would look like, the contours of Jesus' life would look more like Joseph. Joseph, in a lot of ways, is a, is a, uh, a shadow, a type of what Jesus would look like. But the Jesus' life would look more like Joseph, but it would fulfill the promises to Judah. And through Jesus' life and work, Jesus would do for you what he did to Judah. Jesus would show us our sin, give us an opportunity to repent, and then begin that dramatic, miraculous work of us laying like Judah, seeing our sin and being transformed to the glory of God. Of God. Jacob's words to Judah, God's words through Jacob to Judah, are a big signpost pointing us forward to a promise yet to come. They're pointing us to Jesus. The Jesus who would see us more like Reuben, Simeon, and Levi than we would like to imagine. But the Jesus who would pay for our sins and failures, who would give us offer us eternal hope who would allow us to live forever under his kingship. All these blessings, all these parting words are intended to point us to the one who is the giver of all the greatest blessings of all, Jesus Christ. This morning, I say all this to to bring it to a point for you. Do you know this Redeemer? Do you know this Savior? Do you realize that you are more like Reuben, Simeon, and Levi than you dare believe? That you and I, all of us, are like Judas? We're sinners who deserve God's wrath. But through Jesus Christ, we have a chance to be transformed and to have hope for all eternity. Let's pray. We'll reflect on this in our own lives. Father God, as we look at Jacob's parting words to his sons, we realize the depths of our sin. We realize the need for a Savior. And we realize, God, that Jesus Christ came to be the snake crusher. He came to be the hope for all nations. He came to be the king for all time, and we want to live our lives for him. Thank you, God, that Jesus has come to be our redeemer. I pray if there's someone here who's never trusted in Jesus as Savior, they've never laid down their life at his throne, that today they would say, God, I am a sinner, but I believe Jesus has died for me, and I want him to be the king of my life. God, as we transition to our time of invitation, help us to come before your throne in worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand, we're going to sing hymn of invitation 330, Amazing Grace.
We'll sing a couple of verses of this, uh, and then we'll have a chance to, to have some parting words for the Beasley. So let's stand and sing these words together. Come on up here, guys. Um, we talk about parting words. Now it comes to the part of the service where we get to offer our own parting words to Cody and Allie and their family. Uh, I'm not a patriarch like Jacob, so my words don't bear the same weight. Uh, but we still want to be able to speak a blessing over this family. Um, it's hard to put into words, honestly, what, what these two and their family have meant to our church, what they've meant to me. Uh, they came here fall of 2019. I think their first service was homecoming. Uh, we had trunk or treat, and immediately, I'm not even sure if you were on the payroll yet, they jumped in and were helping with trunk or treat. And, and so they were there. They were ready. We had a plan for how we were going to have Cody serve our church, and it was a great plan. I loved the plan so much. Then 2020 hit, and all the plans were thrown out the window. And Cody, as he is and as he does, just adjusted on the fly. He was so flexible. Um, Cody was indispensable in everything we did that crazy, tumultuous year that it still seems hard to believe that all that was real and it happened. He served the youth. He served the men in our Sunday school class. He made the technology work. Uh, if you enjoyed any of those virtual services we watched during that time, uh, it's because of Cody. And Allie, your brother came and helped and was like there, like it. All of those things would not have been possible if Cody had not been here and if Allie had not been here when they were. Cody also served with administration. He was doing things behind the scene. Just all the things that, that we asked him to do and more and over and above, Cody served. He served with a glad heart, and he served with a willingness as unto the Lord and everything he did. And we got to, to meet Brooks, and we got to meet little Eleanor along the way, and we got to see these children be a blessing 
so they are a blessing to our church, but it's also hard to put into words what Cody has meant to me. Cody, you began as an intern. You quickly became a friend and, um, and a partner in ministry. And so it has been a blessing uh, to serve with you. And I, I, I don't want to use the phrase, you serve under me, because really I feel like we've served together. And, um, and, and I've learned from you and how you have uh, done your work well, and I've learned from you and how you're willing to have this call to go to a far place, and you're willing to go and to serve. And so God has clearly laid a call on their lives to move to Texas, of all places. It's going to be very hot there, I want to warn you. <laughs> But God's blessed them. Uh, God's blessed Cody with a really sharp brain, sharper than I'll ever have. And so he's feeling called to go pursue a PhD. Ali and family are ready to go and serve with him. And we want to affirm that calling on y'all's lives. Uh, and at this point, we want to have this opportunity to officially commission them out from Cedar Rock to this mission field that they are going to. And it is a mission field to be able to go and study and live their lives for the glory of God. So this moment... Um, I want to ask you two to stand right here, and not all of you are able to come up here and pray. Some of you are not able to, but if you are able, maybe family, if y'all want to come up too, we want to lay hands on them and, and pray and send them out. So if, I'll let the family come up first. You guys get first dibs. <laughs> And any others that want to come up and be able to lay hands on this family, uh, we want to come and pray over them. A few moments of silent prayer, and then in just a moment, I'll, I'll pray a, a blessing over them as we officially commission them. Come on down, come on down. Father, we come before you today. We come in sadness for a brother and sister and their kids who have become so dear to us. But we come in joy, knowing that, God, you have led them, clearly opened doors for them. And this is your will. This is your next step for this family. And so, God, though we grieve, at our loss, we celebrate in their obedience to your call. Father, we pray for this season of transition. We pray for this move. We pray for all that that entails. We pray, God, that you would be with them every step of the way. We pray for the journey. We pray for the new beginnings. We, God, we pray that you'd help them to find a healthy church quickly to be able to, to covenant with and join in and serve. We pray that you would surround them with friends, surround them with like-minded believers, surround their kids with other like-minded kids. God, that you would bless this family beyond measure. We pray, pray for their families who are staying here behind in North Carolina. We pray that you'd be with them in, in, in the challenges of having family far from, from them. God, I pray that you'd bless them as well. God, we commission them officially to the mission field that you have called them to. We pray that you would use them in a mighty way for your kingdom's sake and for your glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, and just to, if you want to go ahead and have a seat again, I'm going to send Cody and Allie and their family down to the basement so that... Uh, we can, they can be ready for when we're done, and you can go by and say, and say your, your words to them and, and, and give them another prayer, another blessing. So we're going to officially dismiss them to the basement, and we'll be down to meet you all in just a second. So, but, but as we send them off, we want to sing one more hymn together. Uh, and it's wrong in your bulletins. It's actually hymn 581. We have heard the joyful sound. And I intentionally chose this hymn today because I realized I probably wouldn't feel very joyful at this moment. <laughs> but we do believe that God has a purpose and a call for them, for all of us. And Jesus saves. Do you believe that? Jesus saves. 
and God has a mission for them to proclaim that word. So let's stand. Let's sing hymn 584. We have heard the joyful sound. 581, my bad. 581. We have heard the joyful sound. Let's stand. Amen. We'll be dismissed. If you want to go out the front of the church and head down the basement, uh, we'll be able to do that. Even if you don't know the Beasley's that well, come fellowship together. We'd love to, to hang out together after the service. Let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. Father God, we believe Jesus saves. We believe you are a great and mighty God. We pray that you would help us to proclaim it and live it all throughout this day. Father, we bless this food we're about to partake of. We pray that you would nourish our bodies through it and use us for your kingdom's sake. We pray all this. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Go with God this week. Amen.